a few verses. The fourth chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now I want you to notice particularly the next verses, beginning with verse 16 in chapter 4 of Luke. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was... He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Let us pray again. Our Father, we pray that this time of meditation in thy word will indeed be profitable to each one of us, cause us to think upon these things and to allow the Spirit of God to to teach us. For this we pray in his name. Amen. We're going to look at a few passages of scripture I hope you won't mind that. Uh, There's not much much of a space in the calendar today to jot down some of these references. But if you have your Bible, and it is our custom to take our Bible along to the service, uh, you probably won't need to jot down the references. But I mention it now because there are several places we want to look at. Now, in the last time we were together, we were thinking of the importance of men coming to Christ, individuals coming to Christ, and how he meets the need. And now we want to consider why he came, and because there was more than one reason, more than one reason. And we're going to look at several passages of Scripture and allow Jesus to speak for himself. Now, there are other passages of Scripture referring to the reason for his coming to earth, leaving heaven's glory, as we were singing a little while ago, in order to come to to earth and there to be the sacrifice for sins. But there is more involved than that, however very important that it may be. And in the passages, and we're going to go back to Matthew now, first of all, The passages in which we shall refer, we must note the time frame of each passage. And then note when he is speaking uh, to the disciples themselves, to the disciples, uh, when he is speaking to Jews uh, generally, as in the synagogue that we just read. And uh, also when he is speaking to a Roman, a Roman governor. It helps us to uh, understand better the, uh, the reason for Jesus saying what he did. It's very interesting, and I think it's also very important to know uh, what Jesus really said about uh, his coming. We are to note why he came to Israel and why he came to mankind and the purpose in time and its effect on eternity. Why did he come to Israel? Why did he come to mankind? And what was his purpose in time immediately and for eternity for the future? Now just drawing attention 
first of all, to Matthew 5, uh, to a number of Jesus' statements may serve to clarify uh, several misconceptions, I believe. Please note that where he speaks of his relation to Israel, then his use of the words earth and world. He speaks about coming to earth. He speaks about coming to the world. And he even refers to an hour, a particular point uh, in time. So let's see if we can keep some of those things in mind. The framework to whom he is speaking, is it to the Jews, to his disciples, is it to a Roman governor, uh, is it to the nation of Israel in general, and so forth. And then we're going to note the words, I came and I am come. All right, first of all in Matthew five seventeen. 517, so very important and often misunderstood. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, referring to the Old Testament. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to teach the law of Moses and to fulfill its demands in his own life, but also to teach this to this people. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there, the prevailing theology in most of Christendom, probably 90% of Christendom, is the theology that was given by and through the Roman Catholic prelates who taught that Jesus came to establish a new religion that had its roots in the Old Testament, had its connection with the Old Testament, had its predictions in the Old Testament. But this was to be an entirely new thing and that he came to establish his church which they interpreted of course as the Roman Catholic Church and they based that of course on some scripture I think the assertion was made before the attempt was made to find a warrant for it now those of you who have had some Bible study and some a historical background may be aware of this but I probably most of us are not aware that approximately 90% in Christendom what professes to be Christian assumes this that Jesus came to teach a new religion whereas he makes it plain here and it is supported of course throughout later on in the reading that he came to fulfill the demands of the law in his own person but, to, but also to teach the law and the prophets not to do away with the Old Testament but to teach it and this is what he did when he went into the synagogue then if you go to chapter 9 please And the latter part of verse 13, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, you know who he's talking to here. He's talking to his own people, that he's come to call sinners to repentance. And this he has uttered in other places as well. And we should understand that. That in his ministry to Israel, he was following the recipe for revival. The recipe for revival 
was given in the law of Moses that the Lord, Lord God gave to Moses. And that was this, that when the nation went away from God, disobeyed God in whatever area, and then, of course, would follow calamities and punishment, that if they would return unto the Lord, if they would repent and begin to obey his law, he would pardon them, he would receive them, he would bless them. And you find that theme throughout the Lord Jesus teaching the Jewish people. Then we go to chapter 10 in Matthew, and I draw your attention to verse 34. <clears throat> and it's also connected, of course, with verse 35. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And goes on to talk about family members. Uh, being opposed to, to one another. Uh, really a quotation from the book of Micah, chapter 7, verses 3 to 6. Who thinks about that today? Who thinks about it? Very little thought is, is given to that. But he himself said, there it is, we're reading it, we see it for ourselves. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I come not to send a peace, but a sword. And then we go to verse chapter 15. Can we do that? I know this is sort of informal and a little bit different, but I hope we don't mind the change in, in tempo here. Matthew 15:24. He speaks of being sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, it's so easy for us to think of ourselves as his sheep, and we should, shouldn't we? We're his flock. But it's so easy to forget that he had some sheep before he had us. And Israel was his sheep. And there is so much in the Old Testament about that, where the Old Testament prophets knew nothing about the Christian church or the revelation that was to come later on. You have it in the psalm, for example, we are his sheep and the flock of his pasture. That was Israel. And he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The book of Ezekiel tells us that a, rep a descendant of David would be the good shepherd who would come and rescue his sheep and feed his sheep. Very, very interesting. Uh, we have a... Um, uh, you might go to Luke 12 for a moment just to uh, re-emphasize what we had in Matthew, uh, Luke 12, 57, uh, or is it 51? 51. Suppose ye, is that the right verse? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. I wonder who thinks about that today, especially with the emphasis on the, um, you know, the ecumenical uh, movement and, and all of that. Very few think about that. And yet that's what he said. That's what he said. Suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Okay, shall we go to, go to uh, John now, book of John. 
Chapter 9, verse 39. 9.39. And many have stumbled over this verse, but, but don't stumble. We don't want you to stumble. John 9.39. For judgment I am come. For judgment I am come into this world. You notice we mentioned earlier uh, about the place he uses earth he, and coming to Israel and coming into the world. You'll find a different emphasis in the book of, the book of John. You'll find more of his purpose with regard to uh, the uh, salvation for, for all. <clears throat> but we're just going to take a few of them now. For judgment I am come into the world that they which see not may see, and that they which see might be made blind. He said, that's why I came. I came for judgment into this world, not just limited now to, to Israel, although he's speaking to this people, that they which see not may see. And that they which uh, see might be made blind. The judicial judgment of God. Then in chapter 10, verse 10. Familiar to all of us. And while he's talking <clears throat> about Israel, as I mentioned a moment ago. It has implications far beyond that. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now this of course is very familiar uh, to, to all of you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. But it's interesting to see the different things that he brings out when he himself says why he came. Then go to chapter 12. In verse 27. He speaks of coming to die. He doesn't say the reason for his death. But he says for this cause came I unto this hour that was the particular time as he was getting to the close of his his ministry for this cause came I unto this hour he came to die he knew that when he left heaven's glory he knew that during these years that he ministered in public uh, to his ancient people Israel taught them the law of Moses uh, showed them how to apply the law of Moses and called upon them to repent and to believe the gospel of the kingdom that he was prepared to, in, to, to restore then in uh, oh in, in, in the 12th verse go to four, uh, 12th chapter go to verse 46 please verse 46 I think we're quite familiar with this one I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness and notice here the emphasis it's not limited to Israel I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. The implication, of course, is that those who, who do not believe uh, on him are functioning in darkness. They're thinking in darkness. They're living in awful spiritual darkness. And in verse 47... And if any man hear my words and believe not, 
I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. People have had trouble with that one. I hope you don't. The world is already judged, but you can look up the context. It's important that we understand these different aspects where Jesus himself tells specifically why he came. And it runs counter to so much that's being taught in Christendom. Even among those who uh, believe the Bible, and they're not trying to tear the Bible apart, but somehow have accepted what was handed down to us for generations from even earlier than medieval times. Then, oh, the, oh there's one more. We've got to look at that. That's in the 18th, the 18th chapter of this same book. The 18th chapter, where Jesus is before Pilate, the Roman governor. 1837, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. I'd like to uh, give, if I may, a more literal rendering of that in order that we might see the import of it. I checked with the Greek to make sure that I wasn't overstepping the bounds. And here it is. Therefore Pilate said to him, then a king art thou? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest it. For a king I am. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world. That I may bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. He says it himself. Now nowhere that I know of is he specifically referred to in the scripture as the king of the church. I don't know of such a place where he's referred to as the king of the church. There is so much about his coming to be king of Israel. And even the wise men who came from the east said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And the devout in Israel were expecting a king, a lineal son of David, a descendant of David, who would have the legal right to claim the throne. Now he's also spoken of as king of kings and lord of lords. This is in the grand sovereignty of his greatness. But in relationship to the church, he is its head and lord. We have the difficulty in, uh, in our songs sometimes because it's very, very easy uh, to find words to rhyme with king. But it's not so easy to find words to rhyme with lord. And so many of our poets would undoubtedly have preferred to use the word lord in relationship to born-again Christians or to the church but they found it much easier uh, to use the word uh, king. But so far as I know, his relationship to the church is that of head rather than uh, as king. 
At this time of year, I personally like to uh, think about this aspect of his coming as well as the others to which he himself has spoken, and that is that he came to be the king of Israel, as promised in the Old Testament. But he would have to teach the law he would have to call them back to the law and show them how to apply the law. So it wasn't just a matter of repeating words, but, but to understand what the law demanded and required. And if they would accept him, if they would repent and call upon him, he would establish the kingdom in Israel. In fact, the gospel that he preached was the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the grace of God that you and I are called upon to believe and to preach and, and to teach of his death for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection. <clears throat> I like to think upon this. And the nation, however, rejected him. You remember, we will not have this man to reign over us. And uh, we know no other king but Caesar. You remember those expressions. Hard, stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious leadership uh, in Israel. In fact, it didn't take very long before these gospel writers inform us that Hatred was developing. Developing to the point where they were trying to figure out ways to kill him. Although at one time, there was a movement starting, at least in the state of people talking to one another, that they wanted to take him and by force make him king, push him right up there. Assuming that he who could feed a multitude with a few loaves of bread and some few fishes would certainly take care of all opposition. They wanted to push matters that would have been an abortive thing. And of course he withdrew from them so they couldn't get that movement, uh, uh, gain, get that movement have any momentum whatsoever. They rejected him. But God's purpose will still stand. And to me this is exciting as we live in the last days and we're running out of time so far as this dispensation is concerned. And he will come and take us to be with himself. He's going to have his bride with him. But then will follow that awful time of tribulation on the earth, which he himself spoke of as agonies and a tribulation such had never been on the earth before and it would not come again. What's the purpose of it all? The devil wants to crush out what is left of Israel. He wants to crush the Jew. And there will be a remnant, there will be those who will believe during that tribulation. Many will pay with their lives. They will have an influence upon some Gentile peoples as well. But one thing the Bible shows us is that in Israel's gravest hour, this is prophecy now, when it seems that this little group is going to be annihilated and crushed completely, then they will see him. He will come in glory and in great splendor. They will see him whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one, one mourns for his only son. And they'll call upon him. And I believe that there you'll have the words of the prophet Isaiah repeated in a new way and in a deep sense of adoration. We did esteem him smitten of God and afflicted. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. The Jews speaking in the end time. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Jews speaking in the end time. And he whom they once rejected will come in great power and in great glory to establish the kingdom of Israel. These are some of the things I like to think about uh, and, and to try to uh, get a clearer picture in my own mind of the great purpose of his coming, also the several purposes. He came to Israel as the promised prophet to teach the law of Moses, not to start a new religion whether Catholic or any other. He came to Israel to call the people to repentance. He came to Israel to be their king and restore the throne of David in Jerusalem. He came that his person and his message would serve to clearly show the difference between those who desire the truth and those who do not. For judgment am I come into the world. Then what is so precious to you and to me, he came to suffer, bleed, and die for sinners, that they might believe on him and receive life, life eternal. He came that whether Jews or Gentiles, one could be delivered from darkness. The same Jesus it says, he that, he that believes in me, he's not going to walk in darkness, but he's going to have the light of life. All of this, of course, leads us to the very important point that Dean Mangum brought out a little earlier. There is a pertinent question, and it is this. What is your decision as an individual tonight? Will you choose light or darkness? Life or or death, acceptance with God, or rejection by God. See, it all hinges on who Jesus really is and why he came. He's the Son of God from all eternity. I shudder when I think of little, little kids singing about Jesus in a way that shows that they do not understand but that they think that when he was born, that was his beginning. They do not realize that he was long before that, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Parents, parents, you, you, you want to think about that as you begin to teach your little ones more and more about the Bible and why Jesus came and so forth. And you want them to know about his, his birth as well as other aspects of his life. But don't allow them to retain the impression that his birth in Bethlehem was his beginning. He is God eternal. And you see, our eternal destiny depends on not only what we think of Jesus, but what we do about it. Like every other part of Scripture, it's not a matter merely of saying, yes, I believe that that's what the Bible says. It does us no good unless we apply it. I'm sure that makes sense to, to everyone. Now, if he is all that he claimed to be, and all that the Scripture says that he is, and then, so far as our personal need is concerned, he came to die for us as lost sinners, whether Jews or Gentiles, that we might have God's forgiveness and his eternal life. You see, to agree that, oh yes, yes, I like to hear that. I like to hear that kind of preaching. I, 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 I'm in favor of, of, of the church that, that emphasizes these things, but that will not save you unless this same Jesus becomes your personal Savior from sin. I think you'll, you, I don't think anyone will, would disagree with that premise. I, I don't think you would. Uh, you could believe that the elevator works, but if you want to get up to a higher floor, 
You've got to get on the thing. You might believe that uh, there's something free. Somebody was made a notice in a paper in one of the cities in the south that they were going to give away some money. And someone must have had some money to do with. Maybe it was an advertising stunt. But anyway, they had somebody out on the street corner passing out some coins. I, as, I was, as I read about it, I wasn't there. And there were people that turned away. Hmm, they turned away. No, they couldn't believe that anybody would be handing them some money. And undoubtedly, there were others who read about in the paper that it was going to happen. And they said, well, maybe somebody's going to do it. But only those that went and, <laughs> and, and took what was being handed out got anything. Isn't it sad that the devil has a way of getting people satisfied with knowing truth without applying it? And thinking that because they agree with it, everything is okay. In that uh, in an earlier passage, if we'd gone down a couple of verses, uh, we would have read that the demons knew who he was. The demons knew that he was Christ. And of course, they were lost. And the apostle tells us that the demons believe in God. You see, to believe the truth is very important. To acknowledge it as truth is very important. But it's not going to help me. It's not going to help you unless we apply it. Jesus has to be my savior. I have to trust him for myself. Someone else can't do it for me. And I can't trust him for you. So I invite you again tonight. Come to the Lord Jesus if you've not already done so. The one who died for you. The one who is all that the Bible says he is. And trust him as your savior. Your only hope of heaven. Your guarantee of eternal life now and in the hereafter. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that this little study might be more than simply a passing from one verse to another. Help us to understand more fully the importance of knowing who Jesus is and responding to his call of love. Now dismiss us with thy blessing. Cause us to meditate upon these things. And Father, for those who jotted down some of these scripture references, I pray that they will be encouraged and strengthened and edified and informed as they read these verses in their specific contexts. So, Lord, as we go one from another now, make us mindful of the fact that we are to represent this same Jesus. For I ask it in his name. Amen.